Ja. Uh, in our first big tasting of the 2012 vintage on Saturday, the 6th of April, with Christian Wax uh, of Etablissement Jean Pierre Wax, and of course, owner and proprietor of some of the greatest wines in Pomerol and Saint Emilion. So, our first set of questions about the 2012 vintage. Uh, Christian, if you were asked um, to sum up, very difficult, in six words, the 2012 vintage, what would they be? Oh, well, it's a pleasant vintage, charming, fruity. Fruity is the key word, and it is clearly red fruit, sherry. Long after test, I have to find a fault uh, lacking depth, but quite charming. And early maturing. Look, very, it's very unusual for me uh, when we have a sample bottle like that Trochanois 2012, which of course is not finished, I take it home and I drink it with the dinner, which is very unusual. I would not have done that with any of the past three vintages. Oh, 09 and 10 were too powerful, and 11 was not maybe ripe enough. This is so charming. And it's an impossible question, but every wine merchant asks it. Do you think there are any comparisons at this stage that can be made with any other vintage? I've been giving a lot of thought to that question and discuss it with our brilliant winemaker, Eric Morizasco. It may look like a slightly optimistic answer, but the closest I could get to would be 2001. Uh, in terms of fruit and pleasure, and it may turn out to be a surprising vintage. Not surprisingly great, but surprisingly good. 2001 is a vintage that we, we, we particularly like, particularly like. But we overlooked it at first. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did. Um, the volumes were significantly down in both Pomerol and Saint Fignon. Approximately, what were the? Well, you know, more than sig significantly. Um, I tell you first, and I tell you why. Um, I checked yesterday. This is uh, I have had myself forty-three vintages already, and this is one of the three smallest with eighty-four. 91, bad memories, 2012. Why? Uh, because the weather, which altogether was okay, the timing was, not, was never good, which means we had poor weather on the bloom, very uh, uneven set, then a drought, a drought during the summer, and harvest was okay. So, uh, we had the combination of a poor set and, and a, a very severe drought, and that ended as a very small vintage, especially for the top chateaus, which were able to afford the crop cleaning, and that may have been your next question. Why do we, did we need to crop thin so severely? It's because um, an even set, we had by mid-July on the same vines, we had uh, green clusters and almost ripe clusters, or red clusters and green clusters. So it was a dramatic choice. Either you, you left it go, and then you would have had a small normal crop, I would say just below average, uh, but then you had to compromise between some overripe grapes and some unripe grapes to find a, a, an impossible equilibrium. Or if you decided to go for top quality, you have to get rid of all those green clusters which, depending upon the age of the vines, meant 20, 30 or up to 40% of the clusters. Uh, in our own linear, that's what we did. We got rid of those 40% uh, uh, lead clusters and we ended with tiny yields, something like 1.5 ton an acre, uh, which means 20 hectoliters per hectare. Officially, before selection, that was our yeah. prediction. There's clearly, as far as the, 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 the British market is concerned, um, an enormous difference. I mean, we had probably the most miserable summer in living memory. Uh, and yet I remember when we were together in, in August, and I usually 
sort of tour of the sort of final approach time before harvest. The weather was glorious. The weather had been glorious uh, from really the second week in July until what I suppose the sort of second third week in September. Um, there was clearly a big contrast in the weather patterns uh, south of the Loire Valley yes. and north of the Loire Valley. Um, what were, I mean, and also the biggest difficulty in the vintage uh, clearly uh, was a, a, a rain at an unwelcome moment uh, towards the end of the harvest. To what extent did this affect both Pomerol and Saint Domingo? Well, surprisingly, we considered, in all honesty, that the rain which arrived late September was beneficial. Mm. In 2009, for instance, where we had a drought, we had a beautiful storm, a little more than one inch of rain, on August 9. If we had had this year, I mean 2012, that kind of rain uh, early or mid-August, we would have made a very good vintage. So clearly the rain arrived too late, but just was nevertheless positive, which would be very rare because normally it will bring dilution at the last minute like that, but it cleaned those dusty um, berries and uh, uh, probably it increased the crop by 5%, not significantly, but uh, the, 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 the vines look fresher. You know, for the first time in Gironde, uh, which I've been practicing in California for many times, at least which, which I did at La Petrus, I rinsed the, the grapes. First time. People were very concerned. Our team, you know, they said, oh, it's illegal to irrigate. I say it's not significant. But we had people rinsing the grapes uh, about three weeks before the harvest, which we do in California, as you know. And those, uh, the next day they were bright, you know. Uh, we could not do it at a big extent for many technical reasons because the, the rows are so narrow, it's a very difficult organization. When in California, it's much easier. But it worked, you know. So that's what I mean by that last minute rain was welcome when normally uh, one, rain, uh, rain one week before harvest is absolutely unwelcome. And in Pomerol, uh, I understand that the percentage of, of uh, wines harvested before the, 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 if you like, bad rains uh, was in the order of what? Well, there are such things as good and bad rains. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no. The, uh, there was that storm, if I remember correctly, around September 28, yeah. uh, uh, which we consider positive. The, the heavy rains arrive uh, around uh, uh, October 10. Yeah. So the wall of Pomerol was, uh, was picked. I remember we finished picking at Petrus. I have to check, I think it's October 8 in the morning. Yeah. Then we, we went to finish Osana uh, in the afternoon and the rain was just arriving. I mean, the last arrow of picking at Osana was under rain. Uh, and that was the, the very end. And that, those were the cabernets of Osana and that was the end. So, and all those rains which arrived after uh, were, were negative, I would say clearly. Yeah. Yeah. But you were, you, were, you were happily... Yeah, you were, we, were, we, we were lucky, let's put it that way. Uh, on um, a more generic level, I, mean, I think it's clear, certainly from the perception of UK customers, that Bordeaux, in general, I'm not talking specifically, has not made many friends these last few years. What do you think that Bordeaux in general needs to do to retain its loyal customers and, and, and to create new ones, to bring on new, younger customers? It's a difficult question, but it needs to be asked. Well, uh, 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 my son Edouard, who is uh, more sensitive to the market, says uh, uh, that uh, the market needs a surprise. What kind of surprise can you get? Uh, uh, the best surprise, of course, will be uh, a serious drop in prices. The problem, a serious drop in prices, if it comes from uh, Chateau X or Y, does not have a big effect. So it can only come from the top, and we do hope that the first growth, maybe the super seconds, will have a very significant drop, which will uh, be considered as a, as a good omen by the market. 
let's let's see in the coming few weeks uh, what happens. But we are optimistic about that. And, and the second factor, and then we can get a good surprise from that vintage. As I said, it's a it's a vintage for drinking. Uh, so you drink it with pleasure, not a great vintage, but a very pleasant vintage. And consumers, I mean, are you tired of those wines uh, at 14 or 15 alcohol, uh, which you need to sell out, like a 9 and 10? Let's enjoy that vintage like a wine again. You know, it's, it's for drinking, it's not for cellaring uh, 10 or 20 years. And again, this is a specific initiative from one of the first groups that, that you were talking about. Um, Chateau Latour's move away from the en primeur market, in other words, not offering young wines um, uh, before they're in bottle. Uh, I mean, we're lucky enough to have a direct relationship with you, which is slightly uh, atypical of what happens in Bordeaux, but Latour's move is, is interesting for a Medoc property. Uh, what do you make of that? I think it's an interesting move. Um, and uh, it had to be made as an example. Will it work or not? I don't know. Uh, probably they don't know themselves. First, uh, you need to have the means to do something like that. Mm. Uh, there are positive and negative aspects, like uh, in everything. The positive aspect for a buyer is clearly that what you will be offered at a certain time will be the final product on which you cannot make a mistake. You can clearly make a mistake by judging, assessing the 2012 vintage at this point. When you, if uh, Latour releases its 12 vintage in four or five years, it will be uh, what you get is what you get, if I can say. So there will be no kind of surprise on that aspect. That's positive. Is it by speculation that uh, uh, Chateau like Latour does that to optimize the, the profit? I'm not quite sure. Uh, sorry to speak about myself, uh, about Dominus in California, and of course it's not really related, but when I had to move, when uh, um, Seagram Chateau Nesset collapsed, I had to move from the Embrimer market, they were helping me a lot, to the uh, uh, paying uh, wine being offered on the end paid after delivery. That was financially very difficult for me. It will not be difficult for Latour, of course. But believe me, I am in a much better position now because I know what I deliver, I know the precise, myself, the precise level of quality of a given vintage when I release it. And uh, I have a much clearer vision of my inventory versus what the market needs. So, uh, if you can afford it, and I know many wine merchants uh, who say uh, Christian has got uh, uh, drunk too much, uh, uh, it is not. It, it is worth a try. It is worth a try. And do you think this is being because in the last few vintages the consumers' interests have been perhaps uh, sacrificed more in the interests of the chateau proprietor? In other words, has the consumer benefited from buying on prima to the extent that they have in the past and perhaps will in the future? Well, you will know better than me, probably. Clearly, with the weight, they benefited. 09 as well, 10 was a little tricky, and 11, uh, probably, and many people were smart enough not to buy on prima because we, we Honestly, one year ago we were uncertain about the, the quality of the vintage, I think, mm -hmm. because there was a kind of a vegetal character in, in uh, the, the 11, which uh, I'm not sure has disappeared at the time of bottling in a few weeks. Uh, so it's a vintage where you are not in a rush to buy on primer. With 2012, we know it's charming, you know uh, if the price is fair, it is a vintage for un primaire, especially since you will drink it early. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, uh, which is a difficult question to ask um, one of the great luminaries of, of the right bank, do you think that 2012 will be regarded as a left bank or a right bank vintage? You know that I love those vintages which are great on both sides. 
uh, I have a small experience of testing the 2012 on the Medox side. The ones uh, I have tested, the few ones I have tested, were quite charming. And I, was no, I had not heard that word about the Medox wines early on. Uh, I had heard there were some dry tannins, I didn't find them, very honestly. Uh, what we can assume is that, especially in Pomol, of course, with our Merlot on the gravelly soils or on the clay soil like at Petrus, we, we had a, a better level of maturation. That makes sense, which means the, the, and the natural alcohol in these wines is 14 degrees, which is surprising for a good but not a good vintage. So probably the, the, the right side, the right bank, uh, has got a, a, a better level of maturation, but uh, the wines I tested on the left bank have got a lot of charm and a level of freshness, which is a, a slightly tricky word to use, freshness, because some people associate freshness with unripeness. I, I, I don't use freshness usually myself, I must say, but the wines I, I did test uh, uh, on the left bank were, were fresh. So we may have a, a little advantage, you know, the, the nose of uh, um, uh, Neptune Colonge when he won the, the Grand National last year, uh, you know, something like that, a nose, by a nose. <laughs> and if you had, if, which is another impossible question, um, uh, um, if you had to choose a, a wine uh, out of your 2012s that has given you most pleasure both now and in anticipation of the future, what was the best surprise for you in 2012? Or was there not one wine? Uh, in Among our your team, own wines? Mm. Uh, well, Petrus is a special success, there's no question, because uh, uh, thanks to the very unique place soil, the, the regulation of the water, the water, the humidity was almost perfect. So Petrus, from what I have tested so far, is the only one with depth. Mm. When the other ones, as I said, are more superficial and, and charming. So among our team, speaking of charm, I think La Fleur Petrus is very unique this year. It's the first vintage where we incorporated those few blocks we, we purchased uh, last year. Chateau Guillot. Uh, Chateau Guillot. And we selected the best blocks of Guillot, which are next to Le Pain. So uh, La Fleur Petrus has its usual charm, but it has got a little core uh, with, a, I would say, a character of violet, which uh, is next to the, the, the tiny violet uh, Chateau. And uh, it, it has a, a complexity uh, which is quite unique in the vintage. So that would be my, my, my own favorite. And finally, and completely irrelevantly, um, there's the Grand Nationals after you. We should thank you for seeing us on a Saturday, which is an enormous treat. Um, <coughs> do you have a, um, a tip for us in the Grand Nationals well, after you? You know that last year I, I was lucky enough to be on Neptune Colonge. Uh, also, I knew from, uh, from France in the early days. This afternoon, I am on Capa Blue. <laughs> and if I pronounce Capa Blue in a French way, it, it is the most capable, I feel. So, uh, <laughs> we, we'll see in a few hours. Excellent. We'll see you indeed. Christine Rex, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure, Adam. Thank you. Ça va? <laughs>